This week's parsha is Parsha's Chayi Sarah, which means the life of Sarah, which ironically, the first event we see is, is the death of Sarah. So there's a few interesting things about the death of Sarah. At the end of last week's parsha, we had the binding of Isaac, where Isaac was nearly sacrificed by his father, Abraham. And immediately juxtaposed to that is the death of Sarah. Now, the Talmud tells us that these two are not connected by coincidence, but what happened was that uh, Sarah had heard that Isaac was sacrificed or was almost sacrificed. And instead of someone telling her, you know, the, the message, well, before I want to tell you, I've told what happened, but first you should know that Isaac's all right. And then tell her, oh, Abraham tried to sacrifice. Instead, the message was, oh, Abraham sacrificed Isaac. Oh, he tried and he failed, but by the time she heard that, she had already died. And now, that's what the Talmud says. Um, it's actually interesting if you look, because in this week's parsha we have the death of Sarah and the death of Abraham. And the death of Abraham, the way it's described, it always discusses the life of someone before it talks about their death. And this is common in the Torah. When, when Isaac and when Jacob dies, at first it gives them like an encapsulation of their life, and then afterwards it says, and they died. Whereas Sarah, it doesn't say that, oh, that Sarah lived for X amount of years. Rather, it just automatically starts that her life was 127 years, and she died, and that seems to indicate that there was a little bit of an abruptness to her passing. Now, why did she die? So simply, we understand that she was shocked. And it's actually, you know, if someone gets shocked really bad, especially if they're old and frail, you, uh, there's a possibility of grave injury and perhaps even death. My grandfather, one of his books, suggested an alternative approach that I found very interesting. We know at Sinai, the Jewish people experience prophecy. And prophecy is a, is a spiritual elevation. And there's a problem when someone has an artificial spiritual elevation that they're not ready for, it clashes with their body. Now, prophecy, remember, prophecy is communication with God on whatever level, but it's not communication with your body. Your body can't talk to God because your body is physical and God's entirely spiritual. However, you do have another component, which is your soul, which is also spiritual. And if you could isolate the soul from the body, the soul would be very capable of communicating with God. It's not a problem for the soul. It's a problem for the body. So the body, so to speak, acts as an inhibitor, a barrier between our communication with God. Theoretically, any one of us, if we were to be able to isolate our soul, prophecy would happen instantaneously. There's no problem at all to have prophecy. The problem is that we're not just the soul, we also have a body. So the body, or whatever elements of physicality, that's always going to you know, hold us back from spiritual elevation in the form of prophecy. The Jewish people of Mount Sinai, they have prophecy. So it's communication with their soul. Now, who had the prophecy? Everyone. Everyone had the prophecy. And the problem is, is that they also had a body, a physical component, and they weren't necessarily holding at the level where their body was no longer a factor. So the Talmud tells us that at Mount Sinai, the Almighty speaks to the Jewish people, and they die. And the Almighty brings them back to life, and speaks to them again, and they die again. Because if, if, if you, it, it's, it's almost like, a, it's like an electric shock. If you have a, a spiritual communication of such intensity, yet your body is there, and it's, it's absorbing the brunt, so to speak, of the influence, you're not going to survive. My grandfather suggested that it wasn't that Sarah was shocked. Oh, someone, her, her child died, and that's why so she died of shock. It was the opposite. She had such spiritual elation with the notion of what we spoke about last week, of this experience where Abraham was sacrificing his son for God, and the ultimate act of faith uh, that's, that's, that's possible, the act of commitment to God, that it was the opposite. She was so spiritually delighted she, it was like almost spiritual ecstasy, and she wasn't prepared for it. And just like the people at the foot of the mountain, they died, she died as well. Why was Abraham unaffected with his prophecy? The Talmud tells us that the forefathers were Merkava. They were the chariot of God. 
just like a head of a state always has his motorcade ready in case he wants to go anywhere, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were always primed for prophecy. They never needed to be, or give me five minutes. You know, if I told you that some dignitary is coming to visit your house, you said, give me five minutes to tidy things up. And certainly on a spiritual level, like if I said, okay, I need you to concentrate. You say, wait, wait a minute, I have some, something going in my head. I, I, give me a few minutes to clear my thoughts. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were the chariot of God, which means they were always primed and ready. They were always at, you know, at the ready for spiritual communication with God. In a few parashas, we're going to learn about Joseph. Joseph is the son of, of Jacob that is, so to speak, kidnapped, and he's separated from him for 22 years. And when they finally reunite, Jacob goes down to Egypt, and they meet, and it's so it's such an emotional, uh, you know, re- reconnection of the father and his beloved son. And Joseph is crying and hugging and kissing him, and Jacob is stoic. So Talmud tells us why was Jacob stoic? Because he was praying. He was saying the Shema. Why? Of all times to say the Shema. Well, why was Joseph not saying it? It was the proper time to say the Shema. Joseph should be saying the Shema as well. The answer is is that Jacob un- knew that this interaction, this emotional meeting that he's going to have with his son is going to tamper with his readiness, that he was always prepared for God. And to preempt that, he ensured that uh, he would say the Shema before it to accept God, so to speak, and thus to mitigate the negative influence that it would have on his spiritual readiness for prophecy. Interestingly, Isaac in Netrich Parsha, a little spoiler alert here, but next week's parasha, we have Isaac giving a blessing to who he thinks is Esau and ultimately turns out to be Jacob. But in the run-up to that, he tells him, I want you to go make me a steak. And it's really strange. Like, why, if you want to give a blessing to your son, we assume it has you know, prophetic nature to it. Why would you say, oh, I need a huge rack of ribs in order to be able to give you it seems very strange so that's you know if it's spiritual elation that you're seeking why would you say you need to have a wonderful meal beforehand and the answer is is that the body is resisting spiritual growth so one way to deal with that is is to isolate the soul but you still have a body right you can't if you were just a soul you'd be dead so you have to find a way that whatever elements of your body are still present in your consciousness, they have to be assuaged, they have to be tended to. So it's almost as if you're throwing a bone to your body by saying, oh, we're going to have a spiritual ecstasy, but that is inextricably linked with your steak. So the body's happy and the soul's happy. There's both elements. You have to isolate the soul, but you also have to throw a bone to the body. So, you know, it's like when... when uh, they have the all-night learning on Shavuos. There's always some cake and cookies and coffee. Sarah dies, and what happens? So how old is Sarah? She's 127 years old. She's not exactly a very young woman by any, any metric. And Abraham's response is very interesting. So she dies, and Abraham comes to eulogize her and to weep over her. And to me, it's always interesting, because if you were to look at tragedy or suffering, you would say that, comparatively, this is really minor. Sarah, she's lived a full life, 127 years. That's not a short life. Uh, And, yeah, she died, but it's not like she was really young and had a whole life ahead of her. So maybe she died out of shock, and she died a little bit early, but she was old already. So if you were to say how tragic is it, you would say it would be somewhat on the lower scale of tragedy, number one. Number two, Abraham is someone who, if anyone could address tragedy from a philosophical vantage point, it would be him. Abraham is the titanic intellect. He's a gifted theologian. And he's someone who's used to approaching everything from a philosophical perspective. So you would think, on one hand, you have a very minor tragedy or suffering. On the other hand, you have someone who's most capable of saying, well, 
God runs the show, and she lived a full life. He could have rationalized his pain very easily, you would imagine. Yet the Torah tells us that Abraham wept and eulogized. He had to, even Abraham had to address the emotional aspects of pain and suffering. And to me, this is the extreme example. Once you know the extreme example, A, minor suffering, and B, someone who's most capable of seeing it philosophically, that tells you every other case of pain and suffering and tragedy has to be addressed emotionally. We once gave a talk over here about why bad things happen to good people. And it's always a tricky subject to, to explore because of this particular problem. When Abraham had suffering, he didn't sit down and say, let me understand why do bad things happen to good people. Let's approach the subject philosophically. That's not the way he did it. And if he doesn't do it, we certainly cannot do it that way. But there, there is an entire realm of, 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 of ideas that always look at justifying tragedy, that God is in control of the world, and therefore he knows what's best for everyone. I mean, there is this argument, that there's a lot of Jewish sources that talk about that, but not in the wake of tragedy. I had a friend of mine who had a, ch- who had a child that died, and he was telling me that someone told him, I don't remember exactly the exact words, precise words of what someone told him, but someone basically said to him, that you should know that the babies that die are the ones with the special neshamas, or something like that, or, or, or the mighty loves you, something, something to that nature, to not focus on the sadness and to empathize with that. So he said to him, he's like, I hope you also have some special neshamas. Your kids also have a special neshamas, and the mighty loves you. He told it to me afterwards, but it, it's really true. Like, when we, we you know, in, in today's world, when, God forbid, there's a, a sad thing that happens to a child, let's say, we always try to, um, you know, they, if the kids, God forbid, someone's father or parent dies, right? What do you do? You, the first thing that everyone does is everyone buys him gifts. You buy him a PlayStation, you buy him an iPad, let him forget about his tragedy. It's a mistake. It's a mistake because all you're doing is burying the sorrow and the trauma deep, deep down in their unconscious. What you need to do is you have to dress it. You have to cry. You have to eulogize it. And that is a way of, uh, of hopefully gaining healing. It's also surprising the order by which Abraham mourned. Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to weep for her. Usually, someone initially weeps, and then once they regain their composure, then they're able to eulogize. So you would imagine, right? You know, at the peak of tragedy, all you're capable of doing is weeping. But once you gather your thoughts together, you should give a eulogy. But here it's the opposite. Here, Abraham eulogizes her, and then he cries for her. And I think this really tells us a little bit about Sarah. We'll learn more about this as the Parsha unfolds. Usually, the way it works is, you know, someone dies, it's very sad, and it, over time, progressively, you know, the loss so to speak, diminishes, right? And the pain goes away slowly, progressively. However, Sarah, the pain was more than just he lost his life mate or soul mate or whatever. Sarah was one of the, was the greatest human of the time or the second greatest spiritual leader of the time as well. So the further away, the, 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 the further he had gotten from her demise, the more he realized how much he was lacking, the world was lacking on a spiritual level as well. So it got progressively worse, so to speak. First he eulogized her, and then he wept, because the the, the further he got away from from her demise, the more he realized her greatness, and thus the impact of her loss. First order of business is to find a place to bury her, and he finds the perfect spot, and that is what's known as the Ma'ara Samachpela, which is a, uh, a cave that also has a loft to it, and it's in Hebron, in southeastern Israel, and he wants to buy it, and there's a whole negotiation 
taking place between Abraham and Ephron. Ephron is the landowner of that particular place. And Torah growth gives a very lengthy description of the negotiations that took, that took place. Uh, Abraham was one of the greatest celebrities of his time. So he comes there and he says, oh, I want to buy this, I want to buy this plot. So uh, the plot to bury Sarah. And Ephron tells him, oh, don't buy it, take it for free. You're such a special guy. I don't need any money. Abram's like, absolutely not. No. I want to pay top dollar. I want to pay cold cash. I want to pay everything. Eventually, Ephron tells him, well, between me and you, good friends like me and you, 400 shekel kesef. Shekel is a, is a weight of kesef of silver. It's no big deal. Essentially, he's quoting him an astronomical price, and he's saying, oh, between me and you, what's that? And Abraham pulls out his wallet and peels off the money, and he, buy, he gives it to him in, in, uh, in the best kind of currency. That's the story. And then the field of Ephron that had the cave, that became Abraham's. By the way, we're going to meet this burial place a little bit later on as well. Isaac is going to be buried there. Abraham himself is going to be buried there. Uh, Rebecca, Jacob, and Leah are all buried there. There's an interesting little tidbit about this story. The transaction is described. What happens? He gives the money, and as a result, the field gets transferred from Ephron to Abraham's possession. The words that it uses are particularly important because they help us understand how marriage works, which sounds a little strange. Let me just build this for you. The written Torah has in it encoded all of oral Torah. The problem is is that you don't necessarily know. It's very hard for someone, unless they're trained, unless they're educated, to decrypt the Torah, to understand what the subliminal message is. From this story... We know that Jewish marriage ceremonies, what happened when the man gives a ring to the woman and says to her, I'm going to sleep at the bazook, that's supposed to be Moshe Yisrael, which is the words that a man uses. Marriage happens. This is the source. And it's very bizarre because it doesn't mention about marriage. There's no, is there a mention about marriage? In fact, he lost his wife in the story. So how would, how would that happen? So in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 25, it describes marriage, and it says, Ki yikach ish isha, when a man shall take, shall marry a woman. And the word that it uses is kach, to take. And over here, in this particular story, Abraham tells Ephron, I'm going to give you the money and take it from me. Kach, take it from me. And the Talmud tells us from the fact that in the book of Genesis, chapter 23, and in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, they're a million miles away from each other, right? But they both use the same word, kach. One's talking about a transaction, a monetary transaction, with regards to acquiring a field. And one's talking about marriage ceremony. Marriage happens with kach. But that's hinting, that's encoded in there, is that marriage happens with the transference of value or money. Thus, any any Jewish marriage that happens now with the presentation of the ring, this is where it's sourced in the written Torah. So first of all, it's an interesting little piece of trivia, right? And there's thousands of examples of this in the Talmud where it shows where uh, in two totally different aspects of Torah, you have the same word, and that creates a link between those two sections, and we can transfer laws back and forth. Really remarkable idea. But to me, it was always interesting that this particular episode of all the episodes that the Torah could have given is the one uh, through which we know that marriage happens via money. Like, what, what, what's the, what, is there any lesson that we can draw from the Torah utilizing this story, this narrative, as uh, its place to teach the laws of marriage? I had a thought that healthy marriages are ones where each one of them, each spouse, is looking for the positive in their spouse. It means normally, and this is the human condition, we see the positive of our own behavior and our own qualities and our own character, and we notice the negative character of others. There's an imbalance between the way we view ourselves and the way we view others. 
And that causes a lot of problems for us. And particularly when it comes to marriage, if I just see self-justification, I never do anything wrong. And my spouse, when there's something right, I don't notice it. When there's something wrong, it jumps out and I blow up. Oh, why do you do this all the time, right? The human condition is designed to have bad marriages. You're perfectly orchestrated to have bad marriages. Because you never do something wrong. You never need to apologize. You always justify yourself. Other people never do anything right, so they have no redeeming qualities. So what happens? Well, it's terrible, right? But ideally, in the best kind of marriage, where people are are the ones that are, are giving, and as a result of them seeing the good in others, and loving as a result of seeing the good in others, and they're willing to admit their own their own misdeeds, so they have a little bit more of a balance. They're willing to say, oh, I'm not so perfect. Oh, and that person, my spouse, they're so nice and they're so wonderful, they have such admirable qualities, and to ignore the, the negative. As such, every healthy marriage is one where each side, each spouse, thinks they got a total steal. Because as a human, you know, their own personal character, they're willing to see their own misdeeds, and they're willing to justify someone else's behavior. So, you know, after all, all humans are a mixed bad. We all have some good and some bad. But if I highlight the good of someone else and I'm willing to face the negative of myself, well, then the person I'm married to is probably a better person than me. And each side feels like that, and it's a wonderful marriage. Now, what, what happened over here? Ephron, he knows that Abraham is a multimillionaire. And he has this field with the cave... He hasn't been using it. He's never even walked into the cave. He doesn't want it. Abraham, the guy, says, oh, I want this cave. And everyone's like, I can make a mint here. This is the best deal. This is a steal. So I'll start off by saying, ah, take it for free. I'm a big talker, right? When it comes down to action, I want 400 silver shekels, which is an astronomical, but, you know, never hurts to ask, right? And lo and behold, Abram says yes. So he's jumping all the way to the bank. He's, he, he can't believe his luck. What a steal. Abraham, Abraham knows the true spiritual value of that place. So Abraham and Sarah were buried there. Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah. But previously, Adam and Eve are also buried there. Not only that, that particular place is near that entrance of the Garden of Eden. It's a, it's a place of tremendous spiritual potency. So Abraham knows the true value of the place. And thus he knows that he's getting a great deal. So both, both sides of the transaction are so unbelievably euphoric because they got a steal. Says the Torah, this is what marriage should be. Look at this story. Look at this episode as an example of what a healthy marriage should look like. Each side cannot possibly believe their good fortune. But what we'll have to see in, our, in the rest of the parsha, how you actually become that person that has the wonderful relationships. So the, the, the major episode, the major narrative of this parsha is a description of Abraham sending his right-hand man, sending Eliezer, to go find a spouse for Isaac. Parsha starts off with the death of Sarah and the burial of Sarah. And then it describes, initially it talks about how Abraham makes his servant Eliezer swear that he should, when he finds a spouse for Isaac, to not find it from the girls of Canaan that are in Abraham's midst. Instead, to go back east and to go back to Urkazdim and to Chara and to all the places that Abraham was prior and to find from Abraham's homeland, Abraham's family, a wife for Isaac. Not only does he warn him not to take a daughter from the daughters of Canaan, he also makes him swear, which is a little bit surprising. Because Abraham trusts Eliezer with everything. He was the, you know, he was the man of the household. And he even entrusted him with all his, uh, with all his property, with, you know, with all his money. Abraham trusts Eliezer entirely, yet he still makes him swear an oath that he should follow his instructions. So really surprising. 
So how do, how do they do the oath? They do the hand under the thigh. And today when we do an oath, right, you swear on the Bible. Right? What's the idea behind that? Is you take everything that's holy and you say, I'm kind of linking my commitment with what I believe is holy. Abraham, after all, had one mitzvah, the circumcision. He told him to put his hand, so to speak, on his thigh, near all that was holy, so to speak, to link his oath with the mitzvah. Why was Abraham so concerned that Isaac should not marry someone from the Canaanites? So you remember, a couple weeks ago we learned that Noah cursed Canaan. In the aftermath of, of the flood and the ark, he cursed Canaan, the fourth son of Ham. Now the Canaanites are forever cursed, and therefore Abraham does not want his son, who last week we learned, the week before we learned, that there's blessing given through the family of Abraham. So his son is blessed, and he doesn't want his son to be connected to, to Canaan, Canaan's cursed. And there's another interesting wrinkle in the story, because Eliezer himself was a Canaanite. Eliezer also had a daughter that was of mar- marriageable age. So in Eliezer's head, he sees the fact that Abraham has a daughter, has a son, Isaac. I'm his number one guy. I'm the most committed to him. I'm, I'm the leader of his movement. There's no other girl anywhere. Right? He isn't, you know. And I have a daughter. So in, in, in Eliezer's mind, he's positive that his daughter is destined to marry Isaac. And therefore, Abraham says, no, 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 you're going to swear that you will never, ever allow my son to marry a Canaanite, wink, wink, your daughter. That's not happening. That's not happening. And you'll notice, throughout the story, Eliezer is going to be torn because he has an entrenched bias. He would love nothing more than to be eternally bound to the Jewish people, to Abraham's kin. And he knows it's not going to happen. So on one hand, he's still kind of subconsciously going to be trying to pine, to yearn, to allow that Isaac will... Maybe, maybe there's some sort of clause where we could maybe allow for some other opportunity. On one hand. On the other hand, you'll see how he's trying to remove himself, to recuse himself because he knows he has an entrenched bias. So Abraham Abraham tells Eliezer, you cannot take a wife from the Canaanites, and Eliezer asks the question, what do I do if I find the right girl? She's all the way out east in Mesopotamia. And I say, oh, I have the best deal. You'll marry Isaac. Remember, Isaac's not on this trip. Isaac never leaves Israel. We'll see once we learn more about Isaac next week's parasha. He once entertained to try to leave Israel. And the man says, no, 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 you stay here. You never leave Israel. Isaac is not going on this trip. So he has to sell his commodity, Isaac, from a, from a distance. So he's asking a very legitimate question. I meet the girl. Perfect. She's from your family. She's not a Canaanite. How do I, what, you know, how do I, how do I know for sure that she's going to agree to come back with me a thousand miles to the west to marry Isaac, who she's never seen? Really strange. And Abram says, you know what? If the girl refuses to come, then you're free of your oath. You don't worry about your oath. Okay. So Eliezer, he takes, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, procession. He takes 10 camels and they set out with all the money of Abram. Abram, after all, was a very wealthy person. That's part of the sell, his sales pitch. And they travel all the way to Aram Naraim to Abraham's birthplace. They go outside the city. There's a well, and they're waiting because it was tradition that all the girls of the town would come with their pitchers to fill up the water for their animals. And he prays as follows. What does he say? Hashem, God of my master Abraham, may you so arrange it for me this day that you do kindness with my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the townsmen come out to draw water. Let it be the maiden to whom I shall say, Please give me to drink. And she says, Drink, and I will even give water to your camels. She's the one that you have designated for your servant for Isaac, and I may know through her that you have done kindness with my master. 
what Eliezer is doing is crafting a test. He's saying, I'm going to make a test. I'm going to ask the girl for water. And she's going to say, not only am I going to give you the water, I'm going to give your camels as well. She's going to demonstrate that she has kindness. And therefore, she's worthy of being Isaac's wife and the continuation of Abraham's legacy. We learned already last week, Abraham personified kindness. As a result, this is the Abrahamic destiny to be a nation of kindness. The girl should be someone who exhibits kindness as well. So what's also interesting is that Eliezer is almost removing himself from the equation. He's telling God, I'm going to create this test. And the test itself was going to determine the eligibility of the girl. And I'm not going to allow my own, my own personal interests to interfere. And this really shows the greatness of Eliezer. He's someone who recognizes that he has a desired outcome. He would love nothing more than to find not a single eligible maiden for Isaac. That would be his ideal situation. Why? Well, all that's left is his daughter. And therefore, he knows that if he were to be, you know, make judgment calls, he's likely to be skewed towards, well, she's not good enough, well, she's not pretty enough, she's not this, she's not that. He's saying, okay, before we get started, I'm going to re- recuse myself from making any judgment calls. I'm going to make this test, the test that will determine whether or not the girl is kind. And that alone is going to be the uh, determinant for eligibility to marry Isaac, which means interesting. Most of us are not aware of our own biases, and we'll see Eliezer at maybe at certain points were not, was not aware of his own biases. What's really interesting is that this is the particular test that he's devising, a test of kindness. Not only that, the kindness is not measured by a person's willingness to do good to someone else. It's willing to do goodness <laughs> even to, to, to aspects of the situation that are not specifically addressed like the animals. Now, you remember we, we saw Abraham last week. Abraham's kindness was manifest not by doing kindness necessarily to people who needed it, but to do kindness to people that didn't need it or that didn't yield any benefits, like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the angels, because angels don't need food. Abraham had a love of kindness where he felt personally interested in doing kindness even irrespective of the needs of someone else. And here the test is devised to determine the same love of kindness. Kindness to us can sometimes feel like a nuisance. Someone's asking me for kindness. I'm busy. I'm trying to, I'm trying to feed my flock. But I'll do it because uh, they're asking me. That's not kindness. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for someone who has a love of kindness to do above and beyond what is being requested, they're asking for water. And you know what? Who wouldn't give? You see a weary traveler who asks for water. Who wouldn't share a bottle of water with him? But to be someone who really sees the needs of others is to notice not just what they need, but what they need in a more general level as well. Remember, Abraham was described last week as someone who saw twice. He had double vision. He saw once, and then he saw again. And we explained that Abraham had his own personal needs, like we all do, able to notice the needs, uh, his own personal needs. But additionally, Abraham was someone who was capable of seeing the world from someone else's vantage point. He was able to notice the needs of others without being prompted. And this is exactly the test that's being, uh, that's being designed for Rebecca. It's not to say, uh, when there is a need that is raised, will you help tend to that need? No. Will you notice, without being told, the needs of others? And will you try to help them? And that loving kindness, that is what Abraham manifested in his behavior, and that's what we're looking for in a spouse for Isaac. So there's, there's a cool story here. I, mean, I've, I've, I think I've said this to this group, but it's such a wonderful story, I'll say it again. Uh, there was a rabbi on the eve of Passover. And he gets a knock at the door. One of his constituents is at the door. And we know on Passover, by the Seder, he's supposed to drink four glasses of wine. And this, you know, unfortunately a poor person came, one of his his people of his community 
And he has a question. He's like, wait, can't afford the four, the four cups of wine, but he has milk. Can he use the milk instead? So the rabbi is thinking about it, and he tells him, I have a solution. He goes to his uh, discretionary fund and pulls out a nice size, a nice amount of money, and he gives it to the gentleman and says, here's enough money to take care of your needs. The rabbi's wife is there, and she, she's like, I don't get it. The guy wants to use milk to substitute for wine. You gave him a much larger sum than would be necessary to buy a bottle of wine. Why do you give him so much money? So the rabbi tells him, tells his wife, he says, well, this guy's asking to use milk as a substitute for wine. If he's willing to consider using milk, well, that's evident that not only does he not have money for wine, he doesn't have enough money for meat either, because he would never have meat and milk at the same meal. So from his question, I understood what he really needed was not only money for wine, but money for meat as well. So I gave him money for everything. And this famous story, but it really demonstrates the chesed attitude, the kindness attitude that Rebecca demonstrated. You know, when you're presented something, if someone says, oh, this person doesn't have any wine for the holiday, you know, unless you're really cruel, you would say, oh, wow, what can I do to help? Let me buy him some wine. But if you're not willing to look at the world with a double vision from someone else's perspective to really understand what they're going through, what to put yourself in their shoes, you'll never realize that it's obvious that they don't have money for meat either. You know, Rebecca noticed, yeah, this person needs water, but look, he has a whole, person, a, whole, a whole group of people with him and camels and they're all willing from the travels. They also need that as well. Most people don't get that because we're so captured you know, with, within our own little cocoon. And by the way, what we started to talk about earlier, happy marriages. Are, why do we have a tendency to self-justify and to find the negative in others? It's specifically because we're so caught up you know, within our own little world. We don't see, so to speak, the world around us. Like we spoke about Abraham. Abraham, he, he battled his Yetzirah, and therefore once he exposed himself to the world, there was room for faith and for kindness as one. If we are living in our own little bubble, then all we have is ourselves and there's no room for anyone else. Once we open up the little bubble, well then automatically we'll notice the needs of others. We'll have the double vision of Abraham and Rebecca, and by the way, Moses as well. And once you do that, you know what, you know who else will be allowed into your stratosphere? Your spouse. And once you're oriented to see the needs of others, to kind of think about the world from their perspective, you'll be able to justify their behavior as well as your own. And you'll be a little bit removed from yourself, from selfishness, to allow for the possibility, the faint possibility, that maybe you did something wrong. As unimaginable as that sounds. As incomprehensible as that sounds. Once you are taken away from the selfishness, then you you have a little bit more objectivity to entertain the possibility that you may do something wrong. So both of them essentially happen the same way. The same way you unlock your character to see the needs of others, that helps you justify the behavior of others and to be allow yourself to notice the good deeds of others and also to allow for the possibility of admitting fault when you did something wrong as well. Thus, the kindness of Rebecca is not only for the founding of the Jewish people. We have to have superlative kindness in the house of Abraham. Of course, there's that element as well. But every marriage hinges on the degree of kindness and the way it's manifested in this story for success. This is what will determine whether or not the spouses will grow and flourish and deepen the relationship or not. Okay, so uh, he makes the prayer and right away, right before, right as he finishes praying and Rebecca comes and she's the daughter of Besuel, who's the daughter of Milka, who's the wife of Nahor. So she is Isaac's first cousin once removed. She's really beautiful. And as she's approaching the water, Eliezer knows, notices something really special about her. And he runs towards her. And he goes into his spiel. He says, give me the water, something to drink. 
and she says, I'm going to give you the drink, and she runs, and she fills up the water and gives it to him the drink, and after he finishes drinking, she says, oh, I'm also going to give your camels. Interestingly, she doesn't equate him with his camels. She doesn't say, I'll give you a drink, and I'll give your camels. He's not a camel. I'll give you a drink. Once that's done, I'll also give your camels as well, and she's running again, and this interesting, like the same running that we have with Abraham, just all with alacrity to tend to the needs of others, is the same running that she's exhibiting. What, why would you run to do kindness? Because you love it, because you're excited to do it. This is this is what you hope to be able to do. You have the double vision, and you're tending to the needs of others is as rewarding to you as tending to your own needs that you do with speed. And Eliezer is, he, he's so excited. Is, is she the right one? Did the Almighty answer his prayer? And finally, she gives the drink to all the cannibals. And before Eliezer is so confident that she's the one, he actually gives her some jewelry even before he asks her, uh, what her family situation is. And he, then he asks her, tell me, you know, what, which family you're from. She's from Basuel, the granddaughter of Milka and the great-granddaughter of Nachar, Abraham's brother, come stay with us. He's so excited, he can't believe his, you know, the, the providence that the Almighty is helping him with, and, he, and he, he bows before the Almighty. The interesting story, what happens right afterwards, the Torah is very elaborative in the story, whereas the Torah is always, always minces words, always tries to say as few words as possible. Here it seems to give out, the, spell out the whole story in great detail. Not only that, it repeats it as well. So it's interesting when it repeats the story, because when Eliezer confronts her family, he retells them the whole story. The Torah brings it down as well. And what's interesting for us is to notice the slight differences between the way the story actually happened, the way he repeats it. There's some lessons to be learned from there. Rebecca runs home. She tells her family, and she has a brother, Lavan Laban, and he's going to be a, a an interesting player in our story to say the least. And he sees her jewelry and he goes into her friends and he also starts running. The Torah is very specific when it says that he sees the jewelry and he starts running. But the Torah makes it very clear when he saw all the jewelry that she had then he started running. Torah's Eliezer, maybe he could get oh, some jewelry get some for jewelry himself. himself. It's My grandfather would always talk about this, that the Torah, when the Torah describes someone's running, it's describing their most innermost desires. Abraham ran five times last week to do kindness. Rebecca's running multiple times here to do kindness. Lavan, he is running as well because of his greed. If you read the story plainly, you'll see that when he runs to to Eliezer, he he invites him in the house and he's very effusive. When you come in, and I'll take care of your camel. It seems like superficially, he is like Rebecca. That he's trying to do kindness, running to do kindness. But if you read it very critically, you'll notice all of that was prompted because he hoped he'd get some sort of kickback from it as well. Agenda. And the Torah does this a lot. It, it gives veiled criticism, and this is you know, Lavan is heavily criticized here, even though you might not notice it if you if you, if you read it very quickly. Interestingly, when Jacob in two parshas, he's going to go visit Lavan as well. You read their encounter. And when Lavan heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran towards him, embraced him, and kissed him, and took him to this house. It seems just wonderful, effusive love of his, of his uncle. But when do, like the Torah doesn't tell us that, oh, he hugged him and he kissed him, but not, none of that's extra. So what actually happened is that Lavan knows that he has wealthy cousins in the East, and now they're coming here. Unbelievable. Last time they came with 10 camels and tons of gold. Probably they're coming again. So here's Jacob's here. Oh, gosh, stop everything. Run to get him. He, run, he comes to Jacob, and he sees it's just Jacob. He's not holding any satchels. Where's all the money? So he hugs him. And as he's hugging him, he's feeling him. <laughs> where, is he, where is he hiding all the money? And he starts kissing him. He's like, maybe it's in his mouth. He, he can't believe it. <laughs> That's why he did it. My, my girlfriend would say is that running, whenever the Torah says running, unless it's for a mitzvah, it's always going to be negative. He gave a great story. He said he doesn't like when, when people run. Unless it's to a mitzvah. So he said he was in yeshiva in Poland. In Poland, Lithuania, they didn't have 
uh, firefighter, volunteer firefighters. So every little shtetl, every little town, the little wooden huts that were very susceptible to fire. And if one house would, God forbid, caught on fire, it's very fast for the whole town to go up in flames. So every town, every town that had a yeshiva, the yeshiva students, they were the volunteer firefighter corps. It was a bunch of able-bodied young men, and they're there, they're all in the same place. You run in the stream that there's a fire, and instantly they all get up, and they go fetch water and try to, and try to extinguish the fire. So my grandfather was saying that he got the yeshiva, and he's sitting and studying with his chavrusa in the whole, in the whole building full of yeshiva students, and he sees someone running, and it's like they never saw anyone running. Right away, his chavrusa, his study partner, closes his gemara, closes his book, and says, there's a fire in town. And then right away, everyone closed the book, there was actually a fire in town, and they went to extinguish the fire. It was so anathema to run that the only way that someone would possibly run is there was a fire. So if someone ran, that was enough to alert everyone. You didn't have to scream and ring the bell. You just see someone running, that was so surprising that it meant there must be a fire in town. There's no other reason why someone would do that. And he would always say that, like, love and running, and that's not a good thing. And we don't aspire to be like him. So what happens? He sits down uh, with the family, and they start discussing. He gives them the whole batch story. First, they try to feed him, and he says, I'm not eating until I finish my mission, which is a good lesson. You're on a mission, first do your mission, and then you uh, worry about your, uh, about, your, about your food. He tells him, starts off, I'm the servant of Abraham. They might have blessed my master. He gave him lots of flocks and cattle and silver and gold. And there's the son, Isaac. And Abraham made me swear not to take a daughter from the house of Canaan, from the family of the doors of Canaan. Rather, go back to my homeland. Here's the whole story again. And then he repeats this part of the story. This is the first difference that we see. And he says, uh, he says to them, and I said to my master, what do I do if the girl doesn't want to come back with me? Remember, that was part of the conversation. He says to Abraham, what do I do if I try to convince her? She just says, no, she doesn't want to come back with me. What do I do then? And he said he's absolved. He said, well, if she doesn't want to come, then you're absolved from the oath. So if you read it in English, you won't notice that there's actually a difference. But in Hebrew, there's a letter missing. The word ulai, which means perhaps, perhaps the woman won't, won't want to follow me back east. The word ulai initially is spelled with a vav, with the vowel in the form of a letter. And here it's spelled with a vowel in the form of nekudot. In Hebrew, vowels are sometimes written in the form of letters and sometimes written in a, not written at all, but they're in the form of nekudot, which are dots and dashes above and below in the sides of letters, which, which take the place of vowels. So why does the Torah drop the vowel from the first time where Eliezer says, maybe the girl won't want to come back with me, to here when he recaps it, when he's retelling the story to Lavan and Basul and Rebecca's family, it drops the vav. Rashi tells us, what the Talmud says, that when you take out the vav of Ulai, it becomes Eli, which means to me. So when Eliezer was saying... What do I do if the girl doesn't want to come with me? What he really was saying to me, i.e., he'll marry my daughter, right? When he asked the question initially, what do I do if the girls want to follow me a thousand miles back west? That's a legitimate question to ask. Later on, when he's removed from that episode, he recognized that that question was merely a product of his own inherent desire, his own bias, that maybe there's some sort of situation by which we can overcome this ban and allow Isaac to marry in to marry my daughter. And at the time, when he asked the question, he's like, Ulai, well, maybe she won't want to come, and that's a fair question. But once he's removed from the situation, once he's, so to speak, an outsider, he's repeating a story, it hits him like a ton of bricks, Oh, when I asked Ulai, what I really meant was Eli. What I really meant is that maybe she'll marry, she'll marry my daughter. And to me, this is always interesting because we assume 
erroneously perhaps, that we're always motivated by pursuit of truth. And if you were to ask Eliezer at the time when he asked the question, what do I do if the girls want to come back with me? Well, why are you asking the question? You would say, well, it's a, it's, it's a possibility, right? It's not unthinkable the girl won't want to travel away from her family sight unseen to meet Isaac she's never seen before. But the truth is the real reason why he was motivated to ask that question was because he had a desire, you know, he had a, a horse in the race. He, he had a desired outcome that he was trying to cling to. But he wasn't even aware at the time. And it's a little bit frightening to think that if someone has a built-in bias, that's going to affect their behavior, and they won't even know that their behavior is affected. I had an example once with when I was in Israel in yeshiva. So they had brought in groups of, of American college students who come for three weeks to have an Israel trip. It would be like a, a learning trip plus a sightseeing trip very common thing they do uh, for young Jews today. So they partnered one of the rabbis with each, each one of those students would partner with a the rabbi. They would meet for an hour every day before they went to all their trips and all their lectures and sightseeing. They would, we would meet and talk. So they um, partnered me with someone, with a young student from New York, and he was philosophically inclined so we would have philosophical discussions. And he, in his, in his view, the Torah wasn't true. Was not true. And, but he wanted to discuss it. So we went through all the evidence. We had, a, we had like three weeks of an hour each day. We had like a significant amount of time. So we said, yeah, let's, let's go through the issue from beginning to end. So we, we explored some of the classic examples. And we really approached it logically. Like, okay, let's, you know, let's try to, Play this out, like you know, what is the likelihood of it being true versus it being untrue? And I remember, as the logic was overwhelming him, he was responding like a caged animal, and he started floating like conspiracy theories that are so wildly removed from logic. It seems so inappropriate, <laughs> and I realized that. He wasn't necessarily saying, oh, I'm a clean slate. I want to hear what's true. Well, let's evaluate the arguments on their merits. What he was actually saying is, I have an entrenched interest in my worldview not being tainted with. And in my head, the Torah is not true. This rabbi is presenting very compelling arguments. Well, I'm going to say, well, maybe the Jewish people, when they experienced Mount Sinai, maybe they were on psychedelic drugs, and therefore they imagined that they saw something they didn't imagine. And how come this never happened before? Like, how come no no one else is on, you know, only emotion knows the proper shrooms and, you know, mushrooms to allow... Well, also, how do you answer the fact that the Jewish people are eating manna for 40 years and sustaining a nation? Like, how do you explain that? You really, you really kind of... There's limitations, right? Uh, The blood in Egypt, right? Uh, well, if you look at that, it's possible or during certain seasons, the Nile has sediments coming that make it look like, a, you know, okay, fine, you know. But as we're progressing through the arguments, it's seeing more and more removed from reason. And I don't believe that he was even aware of what he was doing. A bias, it really corrupts someone's capacity for truth because, you know, it's like, you know, if, if someone is a lawyer defending their own child on a capital punishment case, the destination is, is set. Like, the child is innocent. No question about it. The only question is, how do we get there? So truth is out of the window. It doesn't matter what really happened. That, that is totally immaterial. Now, by the way, lawyers, that might be their job. But in life... We have to make sure that we don't have a desired destination and say, let's just figure out a way to get there, because then who's to say that it'll be true? If we want to live with truth, that's a way to ensure you'll, whatever destination you want, you'll get there. Uh, but it's, it's a scary thought. And, I, you know, I think it's interesting that the Torah tells us that Eliezer only got it once he repeated it afterwards. Like once, like if you listen to a, if I gave that young gentleman 
like a voice recording of what he's saying, and he's able to listen as an outsider. And he's like, this, this sounds insane. This is not, this is not legitimate reasoning or argumentation. If you can kind of withdraw and evaluate it as an outsider, you're more likely to notice your own biases. Uh, he repeats the whole story and eventually he says to them, I want to take her back to Isaac. And they respond to him, well, it's from God. Clearly that God's orchestrating this. It's from God. And therefore, we're going to send Rebecca back with you. Take Rebecca. And Eliezer hears this and he's so excited and he thanks God once more. They go to sleep for the night and in the morning, the family of Rebecca starts to have doubts. And they say to Eliezer, Maybe she should stay for a little bit longer. She's kind of young. Let's wait it out. Let's think about it. And Liz says, no, you can't do that. Uh, Abraham's waiting. I waiting. We have, to, we have to do it now. So they agree to ask Rebecca herself. She says, I'm going. And they agree to go. Now, the Talmud tells us that the finding a man and a woman from ends of the world, that is an example of divine providence. When the Almighty orchestrates the events to ensure the two people will meet. And it says this is, at, and it brings proof from the Torah and from the prophets and from the writings that that's true. And the example that it brings from the Torah is this exclamation of love and Besuel of Rebecca's family, that this story came from God. So to me, it's interesting that at night, after they hear this whole story that Eliezer tells them, they're so convinced that God is orchestrating again. They're like, yes, from God. And it was real because the Torah, the Talmud actually uses this as an example to show that spouses or spouse finding each other, that's an example of God's providence. They wake up in the morning and they start having doubts about that. Maybe she should stay. And to me, this is another example of how when someone's inspired, their inspiration, it has a shelf life it starts to diminish. You're inspired. Oh, I'm, I can't believe God did this for me. I, clearly, he's running the show. Of course, we're going to send Rebecca with you. The next morning, your inspiration is kind of not there anymore, and you're like, oh, maybe not. And I think the lesson for us is, is that if we want to utilize inspiration and translate it into action, into a way that is lasting, we have to, we have to strike while the inspiration is still hot. If you allow inspiration to be dormant, it's going to wither, wither away. You can be the most inspired you ever were. If you don't make a commitment right away when you're inspired, your inspiration is going to dissipate. You know, you, someone is a smoker, right? And they go to visit their physician, and the physician takes an imagery of their lungs and says, this is your lungs. And this is lungs of someone who's your age, who's healthy, who doesn't smoke. You should know, if you continue along this path, you will die within the next 12 to 18 months. That's what's going to happen to you. And he sees a picture of his charred lungs versus the nice pink lungs of healthy people. And he's like, i got to stop this. And he's inspired. If he commits, then I will never smoke another cigarette, he has a chance. If he says, let me think about it over a cigarette, it's likely that the inspiration will start to dissipate, and by the time he's ready to make a decision, it'll be too late, and that'll be unfortunate. Rebecca joins the cavalcade of Eliezer. Uh, they travel back to, to Israel, to Canaan, and they meet Isaac. And what happens when they meet Isaac? She's sitting on the camel. She lifts her eyes and she sees Isaac and she falls off the camel. Isaac had a very striking visage. He had a countenance, a very holy countenance. Someone, something that she's never seen before. She's never seen someone this holy and it was so surprising and, and jolting to her that it caused her to fall off the camel. Fine. And Eliezer tells Isaac everything that happened. And the last verse of chapter 24 this is verse 67, reads, And Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. He married Rebecca. She became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was consoled after his mother. 
very, very strange verse. It's describing the budding relationship of Isaac and Rebekah, and it invokes Sarah, Isaac's mother who's deceased, twice. I'll read it again. And Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. He married her. She became his wife. He loved her, and he was consoled after his mother. Why are we invoking Sarah so frequently in the marriage, in the budding relationship of Isaac and Rebecca? So Rashi tells us, very interesting, Sarah was a wonderful woman, and she had miracles that were existing in her merit. She had three miracles. What were that? When she would light candles on Friday night for Shabbat, those candles would not be extinguished until the following Shabbat. When she would make challah for Shabbos, she would be, make a small little amount of, of dough, but it would translate into loads and loads and loads of loaves of challah. And lastly, there was a, a, a cloud, a spiritual cloud that was always present above her tent. These were the miracles of Sarah. Sarah died, and the miracles went away. Now, Isaac now has a wife, Rebecca, and he brings her into the tent of Sarah. He puts her in the same tent, and he's basically giving a test for her to see what's going to be when Rebecca goes into Sarah's tent. And you know what happened? All the miracles came back. Once again, the cloud of Sarah re- re- returned. The candles lasted from Friday night to Friday night. And there was a blessing in the dough. And he loved her. He was so excited with her greatness and her piety and virtue that this engendered the love. And now he's consoled. Now there's someone in his life of the same spiritual heights of Sarah. So he's consoled. Now, this verse, by the way, also describes the first instance of love in the Torah. Isaac brings Rebekah. He marries her. She becomes his wife. And then he loves her. And to me, it's not a surprise that in the same verse that describes Isaac's discovery of her character, that is, that the miracles of Sarah resume with the advent of Rebekah, that engenders the love that he had for her. Thus, what we spoke about all the way at the beginning of our talk here, about the idea of what a happy marriage looks like, where everyone notices the good of other people, Isaac brings her to the tent and he sees the good of her. And you know what that does? That causes the love. Why do we love other people? We love them in exact proportion to our capacity to see their qualities and character. If we see their qualities and character and we see the virtue of their behavior, then we'll love them. If we're used to only seeing the negative of other people and not the positive, we won't love them. Isaac recognized the quality of Rebecca, and therefore he loved her. If Isaac was not someone who was looking for the qualities of someone else, it's possible he wouldn't have loved her, because he wouldn't have noticed her qualities. Rebecca is someone who's willing to see someone else's needs even before they're told about that. She's someone who's removed from the selfish cocoon that causes people to only see the good in themselves and the bad in other people. So thus, both spouses are demonstrating the quality of noticing the good in other people, and they had a wonderful relationship, and they loved each other. And by the way, we have a mitzvah in the Torah, to love our fellow. Which kind of fellow? Does it say which kind of fellow? It doesn't say. Every fellow. How is it possible to love everyone? You should... If it says love the really good people, the righteous people, let's say DTM, that makes sense. Those people have admirable qualities. Here it says love everyone. And it doesn't really give give us a a formula of how you do it. The Torah is commanding us to have an emotion. The Torah can tell us, okay, put up a mezuzah, eat eat matzah, study Torah. All those things are things that are actions. Actions that you could do. Here it's an emotion. Love your fellow as yourself. Clearly the Torah believes that we can flip a switch and love our fellow as ourselves. How do you do it? I believe here is the answer. Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah. He saw her qualities. He chose to see her qualities. And as a result, he loved her. Every human in the world is a mixed bag. None of us are perfect. If we were perfect, we wouldn't be humans. If, If every human has 
a, a mixed bag of positive and negative character, then the only question really, uh, the, only, the only question that really really is is what are you going to focus on? Are you focus on the positive and the, or the negative? If I choose to focus on the positive, I love them because everyone has something that's admirable. If I choose to harp on the negative, I'll hate everyone because everyone has something that's less stellar or less than admirable. Okay, so the Parsha ends where Abraham remarries and has a whole bunch of other kids and he dies at the age of 175. But once again, before he dies, he makes it clear that his legacy goes to Isaac and not to the rest of his other children, not Ishmael, not the rest of them. He dies at the age of 175 and he's buried by Isaac and Ishmael in the same cave that he had purchased at the beginning of the parasha, uh, where he buried Sarah. Ishmael was older than Isaac. Yet, who buried him? And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. So Rashi tells us, the Talmud tells us here, that this is evidence that Ishmael repented. From the fact that he was willing to allow Isaac to go before him, that's proof that he repented. And the way this works is that Ishmael recognized the primacy of Isaac, and even though Ishmael was older, he ceded to Isaac, and he said, Isaac, you go first, you're, you're more uh, the legacy, the heir of Abraham. And that's proof that Ishmael repented. How is that possibly proof? Ishmael might have he done, he may have done lots and lots of sins, and the fact that he allowed Ish, Isaac to go ahead of him, how is that proof? So I want to suggest here that repentance, that's a reflection of someone's values, right? If someone sins, it's because they choose to value the sin ahead of God. God says, don't do it, you say, I'm going to do it. So, really at its core, sin is can be traced back to cognitive failures. When Ishmael demonstrates that in his mind, in his cognitive totem pole, Isaac is of higher stature than him, that shows, at a minimum, that he has his priorities straight. Once someone gets their priorities straight, everything else will follow. The reason why we sin, the reason why we may have misdeeds is because we have a, something perverted in our priorities. Once we are able to straighten our priorities, everything else will follow. I think it's just a very nice lesson for us because, yes, Ishmael might have done a thousand sins. And did he repent for each, each one of them? Maybe not. But what all the Torah knows here is that he allowed Isaac to go before him. He gave honor to Isaac. That shows that his priorities are becoming more just, that already is enough for the Torah to conclude that he repented. That's already, he's on his path humility. towards repentance. Humility, humility and, and, and recognition of, of the greatness of, of Isaac. And that's the end of the Parsha. Next week, we'll really get into Isaac himself. Isaac is a very enigmatic character. Very strange, the Torah's portrayal of Isaac. And of course, Isaac and Rebecca are going to produce a very interesting pair of twins.